Hello! The potatoes and the laundries were back in court earlier this month. I have made other videos about this case, so please check them out. But a quick recap for those of you who haven't followed the Brian Laundry and Gabby Petito case. If you know about the case, and if you know what Roberta Laundry's letter says and about the controversy surrounding when it was written, you might want to skip to 5 minutes 20 seconds. Gabby Petito was murdered by her boyfriend, Brian Laundry, and that was back in August 2021. They had been on a road trip in a van across the United States and the two of them were young. Gabby was only 22 when she was murdered. Brian Laundrie came home alone and Gabby Petito was missing and during this time which went on for several weeks Gabby Petito's parents were trying to get in touch with Brian Laundrie's parents and they weren't having their calls or texts returned. Brian Laundrie came home in, in, in Gabby Petito's van by himself to his family's home. That family, knowing that Gabby was dead, knowing their son had murdered her, knowing where the body was. The lawsuit alleges outrageous behavior of intentional infliction of emotional distress by Roberta and Christopher Laundrie during the time Gabby Petito was missing. The case is currently scheduled to go to trial in 2024. And one of the pieces of evidence in this civil court case is a letter that Roberta Laundrie wrote to her son, Brian. Here's what the letter said. I just want you to remember I will always love you and I know you will always love me. You are my boy, nothing can stop me loving you. Nothing will or could ever divide us. No matter what we do or where we go or what we say, we will always love each other. If you're in jail, I will bake a cake with a file in it. If you need to dispose of a body, I will bring show up. I think she means I will show up with a shovel and garbage bags. If you fly to the moon, I will be watching the skies for your re-entry. If you say you hate my guts, I'll get new guts. Remember that love is a verb, not a noun. It's not a thing, it's not words, it's actions. Watch people's actions to know if they love you, not their words. And then she quotes from the Bible. Therefore, I am certain that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor the ruling spirits, not things present, nor things to come, nor powers from above, nor powers from below, nothing in the entire created world can separate our love. Neither hostile powers, nor messengers of heaven, nor monarchs of earth, nothing has the power to separate us. Nothing can separate us, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not threats, not even sin, not the thinkable or the unthinkable can get between us, not time, not miles and miles and miles. The argument of the lawyer for the Petitos is that she wrote this letter after Brian had returned from the road trip when Gabby Petito was still missing and that therefore she knew that Gabby Petito had been murdered. On behalf of the Laundry family, it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. That statement was issued with the full knowledge and consent of the Laundries, with the full knowledge on the part of the Laundries that Gabby was not alive. And the reason they believe they have a strong argument is because the letter says burn after reading on the front which suggests that it's very secretive and that it shouldn't become public knowledge no one should ever know about it and that inside the letter she talks about how she would help him bury the body and help him to escape from jail. Roberta Laundrie's lawyer says that the letter was written before Brian went off on his trip with Gabby and that when his mother was saying these things, the intention wasn't to talk about a literal body that needed to be buried or that she ever thought her son was really about to go to jail, that instead it was an expression of her love for him at a time when their relationship was going through some turmoil. Roberta Laundry has said, although I chose words I thought would be impactful with Brian, given our relationship, the letter in no way related to Gabby. She said that the point of the letter was to reach out to Brian while he and I were experiencing a difficult period in our relationship. I had hoped this letter would remind him how much I loved him. 
in some way. I did not want anyone else to read it, as I know it's not the type of letter a mother writes to her adult son, and I did not want to embarrass Brian. That is why I wrote Burn After Reading on the envelope, she said, and I knew that Brian would know what I meant. I'm now appreciative that he actually kept it. My own personal guess is that actually Roberta Laundrie did write this letter before the trip, you know, and that, um, and that when she said all of that stuff, it was meant to explain how much she loved her son. But I could be wrong, obviously. This could be evidence that she knew exactly what had happened. And, and I also think that she may well have known what happened anyway, regardless of when she wrote the letter. It just seems so dodgy that she didn't return any calls or texts about Gabby. I think something else unrelated to um, whether she knew or didn't know about the murder. I think something else very powerful comes through and I think that that will have had a really big effect on who Brian Laundrie turned out to be, having grown up with that kind of relationship with his mother. If we can get to the bottom of why Brian Laundrie was out of control of his emotions, we can get more of an understanding of why he murdered his girlfriend. It's interesting because what I understood from what Roberta Laundrie said about how this isn't the kind of letter a mother would write to her adult son, what I understood from that uh, in terms of my own um, reaction to the letter was that this is the kind of letter you might write to a lover, you know, or maybe to your husband. But the, the thing that makes it very unusual and strange to me that this is written to a son is partly how much it goes on and on about this unconditional love between them. I mean, it, it, it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> It doesn't feel to me like a mother who's saying to her son, I know we've had a rough time, but I want you to know that I love you unconditionally. No matter what you do, I'm always going to be here for you. That letter would have been about a mother wanting something for her son rather than wanting something for herself. This letter talks about how not only will she always love him, but she knows he will always love her and that nothing could ever divide us. We will always love each other. You must be quiet, baby. Please relax. Just go to bed, go to sleep for a bit, and then we can talk afterwards, okay? Yeah, but you can be quiet for a little bit, can't you? Hmm? Good boy. It's understandable that a mother would want to convey that her love for her son is unconditional. But it doesn't feel normal that she wants to convey that her son loves her unconditionally. That's the bit that feels weird and uncomfortable. You don't have a child to love you unconditionally. That's not the point. And it feels very claustrophobic and suffocating that he is now going away with his girlfriend, assuming that Roberta was telling the truth that she wrote this before he went away, that he's going away, you know, very far away with, a, with another woman, you know, um, across the country. And he's gonna be doing his own thing in an adult way because before that he and his girlfriend were living in her house. Now he's, he's spreading his wings and leaving. And so all of this spells need, you know, it spells out this need that she has, that she wants him to meet, a need to be thought about, um, a need to be very close to somebody who is now his own person and is, has moved away, you know, a need almost to reverse all of that and keep him at one with her, you know, almost like he's still in her womb. And that only really makes sense for someone who is pregnant, you know. After that, a healthy mother is going to want to see her child develop and become his own person eventually, you know, do his own thing. She's going to discover who he is and what he likes. He isn't someone who's there for her in any way. He's not there to meet her needs and be a part of her. And 
all of this to me in this letter spells something called enmeshment. Um, that can also be parentification, you know, that, that's a form of enmeshment. Enmeshment is when you are one with another person. There aren't boundaries between you. If something affects you, it also affects them. That is what emotional incest is all about. Emotional incest doesn't have to have anything to do with uh, sexual incest, you know, between family members. It doesn't have to have anything to do with sex, although it can involve, um, it can involve uh, sexual elements. It's all about crossing boundaries and ignoring that they should exist. And that's why this letter feels so inappropriate. And I wonder if the embarrassment she says she's worried he's going to feel, I wonder if that was her being in denial about her own shamelessness, really, of not letting her son be an adult, not letting him go. A lot of childhood abuse is a result of enmeshment, of emotional incest. It means that the child doesn't develop an ability to see themselves as their own person. They get used to putting other people first. You know, they feel like that's how they have to be in order to survive because the child of someone who has such a big need that, that they, the child, is supposed to be meeting, they can't afford to look out for themselves. In order to survive, they have to try to meet that parent's needs. So they become very good at spotting when the parent isn't happy, um, when they might be anxious, when they might be angry, when they might be needy, and they become used to being the go-to person to try to help that parent to feel better. And this can happen when, uh, say in this case, Roberta Laundrie, if she wasn't that close to her husband, if she um, didn't feel like she could confide in him and she needed that closeness from her son. Or it can also be a result of someone being so needy that one person, one partner isn't enough for them. It's not enough to fulfill their needs. They, they are overspilling, you know, their needs are just sort of seeping into other relationships as well. This is abusive because there's no respect for that child being their own person and there isn't sufficient respect for that child having their own needs because a child's needs include being supported unconditionally to be their own person. And what's ironic about this letter that's all about unconditional love is that it's not unconditional love if you have all of these expectations that your child needs to meet your needs. That's very conditional love. And it has a huge impact on someone's development when they're growing up. Signs of emotional incest are when one parent expects the child to side with them if there's an argument between that parent and the other parent. They might go into your room when you're not there. They might look through your things. They've got no sense of um, boundaries between you and them. They feel that they're entitled to do that. Your parent might have felt jealous of your relationships, whether they were sexual relationships or just friendships, close friendships that really might have triggered something in that parent because they were used to getting all of your attention and they were used to you being under their control. Maybe now you seem to be under someone else's control. I mean, consider how inappropriate this is that Roberta Laundrie's son is now going off with his fiance and that's when his mother decides to give him this card that goes on and on and on and on and on about their unconditional love for each other. Why had they fallen out in the first place? Did it have anything to do with his relationship with Gabby? Could it have been that his mother was smothering him when he wanted autonomy and privacy so that he could be a partner to her? If the card was written before they went away, then the timing does make me wonder. 
They might have wanted to offload on you. They might tell you secrets about themselves, very personal things that are really inappropriate to tell you about. They might even talk about sexual experiences they've had. And you're not old enough yet to comfortably be able to support an adult. They needed you to comfort them. They needed you to make them feel better about themselves. They needed you to make everything okay for them when they were angry, whether they blamed you for it or not. And they made it clear to you that that is your role, that that's completely normal for you to be being there for them. They might have sought advice from you. They might have needed you to help them with one of their friends or maybe something that's happening at work or maybe your other sibling. And this advice can just be about seeking reassurance from you, you know, wanting validation when you're the age where you need their support. They might want to inspire guilt in you, you know, to tell you about how stressed they are over money, for instance, so that you don't dare ask for anything for yourself. There's a lot of manipulation that can go on with emotional incest because it's about having control over the child. It's about the parent feeling like their child is an extension of them, that they're entitled to whatever they want from that child. And when that child feels enmeshed with them, when they don't feel like a separate person, then it's very easy for the parent to get what they want from them and to brainwash them into thinking that this is something they're happy to do. Often that love is so conditional that without the child being there for the parent, they don't feel loved. And so they do believe that this is a role they want to play. It feels like it's in their interest because then they get all of this admiration and love you know from that parent emotional incest can also happen when one parent dies and the other one feels like they can't cope and they need to use their child as a crutch or it can be when they have a big illness themselves they might be addicted to something they might be alcoholics they might be addicted to a drug in all of these situations that parent is not emotionally present for the child that child is not getting their needs met the parent is too focused on getting their own emotional needs met they might even seek reassurance about whether they're a good enough parent. You know, they might want to hear you say that they're doing really well, but the way they say it is not actually with the child in mind. It's actually about getting reassurance for themselves. And so it's another manipulation. Roberta Laundrie said, if you hate my guts, I'll get new guts. In other words, I'll change myself for you if that will please you. That's a lot to put onto your child. It's needy. It's about wanting reassurance. It's acting the role of the child instead of the parent. So it's encouraging the child to have to play the role of the parent. If you've experienced emotional incest, some of the things that you might have experienced are not knowing who you are, not having a real sense of your own identity, not being sure about what you like, getting confused maybe about what you want to study or what work you want to do because you're so used to seeing who you're supposed to be through your parents' eyes that you can't see your own needs, you know, and what and take them seriously. You might be likely to be a perfectionist, you know, always trying to make yourself into whoever you're supposed to be for that parent that can go on into adulthood where you always feel like you're not good enough for other people you know and you somehow have to improve yourself maybe you have to look better or maybe you need to have a better job or wear better clothes um, or become you know have more friends or have a better car but whatever it is you're measuring yourself all the time because you feel like you're not good enough and that's because you weren't good enough you know you had to be this prop for that parent you weren't valued for who you were you were just valued for what you do for them you might have difficulty setting boundaries and enforcing boundaries with other people. You might find that your romantic relationships don't last very long or that they are very tumultuous. You know, you might find yourself with other people who take advantage of you, who um, are friends with you or in a relationship with you just because of what you can do for them. And, and actually, they're not very supportive of you. 
You might find that you're always the one arranging social things with your friends or trying to keep in touch, trying to keep everybody else interested, maybe even your family, and they're putting far less effort in. All of these are signs that you had to put loads of effort into trying to maintain some kind of connection with one of your parents. And when you've experienced emotional incest, that is what you have to do all the time. You can't be your own person. If you were your own person as a child, they wouldn't have got what they needed from you. They would have been dissatisfied. They would have been more emotionally distant. They wouldn't have valued you. They wouldn't have found you worthy of their time and attention. Some people who have experienced emotional incest can also experience a sense of superiority. They can believe that they're better than their peers, you know, because they've been an adult when all of their peers have been able to be children. And they've grown up feeling like they have so much power because an adult needed them so badly. And that's where we get to covert narcissism. You know, I talked about this in relation to Chris Watts in the past, uh, about how if you're not loved and you're only valued for what you can do for that parent, you can end up um, believing that that is who you are. You are your ability to have power over others. And that becomes your mask, you know, this person who others really need, others rely on, you can be the hero, you can appear to rescue them, um, you can target people who have themselves been abused or neglected, and you know, and they need you because you seem to be the answer to all of their prayers. And then you can end up getting your anger out on them because you feel used by them. And so you end up becoming abusive towards them. That's how a covert narcissist functions. And I think that that is what happened with Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito. But he came across as this sweet do-gooder, you know, who believed in um, being kind to your environment. He came across as quite softly spoken. He came across as quite shy, quite polite and somebody who's quite humble when in reality it seems that he was actually you know and you can look at my past videos about this where we look at why you know and I can talk about different evidence there but how he was actually entitled he was actually arrogant he was very judgmental and he was abusive towards Gabby Petito Notice how childlike he is throughout this video of him and all of the photos of this footage, how every position he takes is like the position a child would take because she has infantilized him. We can see from the way she writes to him that she talks to him as if he's a child, but at the same time, she also talks to him as if he's the grown up and she's the child. So he's getting mixed messages, but he does know that when needed, he has to become small. It always seems to be about trying to make himself smaller. And I think he would have got that because of a relationship he grew up around. And I'm thinking that it's likely from this uh, card that that would have been the one with his mother, that he needed to stay a child for her. He needed to stay an extension of her. I think that his rage towards his mother was coming out onto Gabby Petito. His rage that he might have been completely unconscious of who this was actually about, how he wasn't allowed to just be himself, how he didn't get that unconditional love he needed, how he had to be there for her. And instead he might've just found that it came up in his relationship with Gabby, that he had all of this distrust and he had all of this anger towards her and jealousy perhaps, you know, as I talked about in other videos. Emotional incest for boys has a different impact than it does for girls. Um, there was a study that showed that for boys, it was most likely to lead to an inability to control your emotions. And of course that would make sense if uh, the murder of Gabby was not pre-planned, if he ended up strangling her because of his rage that he felt out of control of. 
it seems that Brian Laundrie's pattern with Gabby Petito was he was there for her, looking after her, helping her with the things she needed help with, like her filming project, you know, for her Van Life YouTube channel. He was doing all of this stuff, but then all of this resentment would come out. And if you think about emotional incest, it makes sense that that kind of pattern could come out of it, that somebody could end up being, a, you know, coming across as a real people pleaser, coming across as a rescuer, because that is the role they're used to. That's how they feel empowered and strong, and that is their identity. But then they end up feeling very resentful because they weren't really being themselves. They were being who they thought they had to be in order to be liked by the other person. And so all this resentment then comes out at the other person, they, um, there isn't any honesty between them. It's all kind of fake. The love on both sides is based on this connection that isn't real. And, and all of this applies to a relationship with a covert narcissist. There's a reason why in Psycho, <laughs> there's this emotional incest between the mother and the son because of what that relationship can do to that child when they grow up and become an adult, you know, what kind of person they become and how there's this, you know, if you think about Psycho, if you've seen the series, there was an excellent series about it. And, um, and in that series, it was on Netflix, The Sun, he had um, a lot of insecurity and self-loathing. And at the same time, he had this real um, sense of empowerment about him, where he felt like he had this power and control over his mother, yet at the same time he was controlled by her. And that then came out in other ways with other people. He started to need more of that control over other women, because with his mother, he could never quite have enough of that control because she was always controlling him. If you've had a relationship that was emotionally incestuous with one of your parents, that doesn't mean that you are now going to be a covert narcissist. You know, it depends on what happened as you developed. Many people instead turn against themselves, especially women. So they're not going to be covert narcissists. They're not going to be manipulative and jealous and so on of other people necessarily, but they're more likely to beat themselves up to be super hard on themselves and to let other people treat them badly. You may well find that you have got some narcissistic traits or that you did have when you were younger and you've managed to shake them off because you've managed to have closer friendships or support from a therapist and that has helped you to overcome some of these needs to control others, you know, or to have attention or, um, or it might have helped you to feel less angry. Or you may have been very judgmental. You may have seen people through that parent's eyes, that parent who is so hard to please. If you've experienced emotional incest, your mood would have hinged on your parents' mood. Maybe your successes at school meant a lot to them. You had to do well. That's what would make them happy and proud. You had to give them something they could boast to their friends about. You had to inspire them somehow and impress them. When they were upbeat around you, you must have been doing your job right. When they were miserable or angry, you'd failed. And knowing how important their mood was to you might have been something they used against you. So you will have grown up carrying a lot of emotional baggage and feeling a lot of responsibility for somebody else's emotion. And that is so hard to shake when you're an adult. You can't just magically realize that actually you're not responsible for everyone else's feelings. And you can't suddenly find yourself interesting and important and be able to put yourself first. It's something that you have to learn to do. So if this sounds like you, what can you do to help yourself? Well, it's all about getting in touch with what you need. That might mean cutting off 
even if it's just temporarily from that parent who's had all of that power and control over you, you know, making sure that there's a complete break in contact for a period of time while you begin to heal and, you know, pay attention to what you are interested in, what you need, what you like, and, you know, what makes you tick who you actually are by not having them continually commenting on you and your life. Learning about how to enforce boundaries with other people, that's really, really important. And this is something you can get help with in therapy. And, uh, and, and at this point, I want to say something about my courses. Um, it's actually a really great moment to talk about the, the courses that are coming up because it's so relevant to this topic. I'm running courses, there are still places on some on, on the courses that are starting in July. They're just going to be for small groups. I'm not going to have more than 12 people on each group in each group, you know, because it's going to be an intimate kind of atmosphere. And we're going to look at the kinds of things that would have come up if you have grown up in a situation like that. So if you feel guilt easily, if you feel overly responsible for other people, if you keep putting other people's needs in front of yours, um, if you feel maybe convinced you're a bad person because you're putting yourself first, if it feels weird to be assertive with others, you know, if you feel like you're being extremely rude whenever you're just trying to draw a line and set a boundary, uh, that also feelings of worthlessness. If you feel like um, you're really hard on yourself, you feel like you're a failure or a loser very easily. If you push yourself like crazy and you're a perfectionist, all of these things <laughs> are going to be covered in this course. So please let me know if that's something that interests you. Please send me an email to contact at liveabusefree.com and I can send you the course information. So I hope that was helpful. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I'll see you in the next video.